Welcome to section 5.3, where we talk about conserving our natural resources and in general trying to fix some of the stuff that we've screwed up that we talked about in section 5.2. So the first thing we need to discuss is kind of just some definitions when it comes to resources. So the first thing you're going to see a lot is this idea of renewable versus non-renewable resources. Now the idea here is when you use a resource, most resources will replenish themselves at some rate. So the replacement rate is how fast nature can make more of something. So it could be uh, trees if you're talking about lumber. It could be natural gas or oil or, or coal if you're talking about fossil fuels. Uh, it could be if you're talking about animals, it could be how fast they reproduce to replenish themselves. And if we compare the rate at which we're using something to this rate at which we are getting more of it, we can get a sense of are we exhausting it too quickly. So a renewable resource is going to be one where our use rate is ultimately less than or equal to our replacement rate. So in general, replacement rate is going to be fairly high. The use rate is going to be fairly low. That's a good situation for a renewable resource. Now for a non-renewable resource, this means we're using it too fast. Now this doesn't mean that it can't be replacing itself, it's just not replacing itself fast enough. So it's kind of like if you have money in your bank account, but you're still spending more than you earn. Your bank account's going to keep shrinking. This is not a stable long-term arrangement, so we'd consider that non-renewable. Now keep in mind, if our use rate changes, a resource can move from renewable to non-renewable. So just because we can grow more trees doesn't mean that it's a renewable resource. It's only renewable if we're not using trees faster than they can be grown. If we do start to do that, it moves into the non-renewable column for that period of time. So we have to be aware of all of our resources. Don't just assume some of them can be made more of so they're safe. All of our resources can move between these categories. It's just how fast can they get replaced? How much are we using them? Now this idea of sustainable use is one that's gotten more popularity recently, which is the idea of making sure that we're using all of our resources renewably, where we make sure that we're using all of our resources at a rate at which we can reclaim them. Now some of that could be replacement and some of it could be things like recycling. But this means we have to make sure we're not using more than we can at some point get back so that we're not going to keep going into a deficit. And the uneven consumption idea here is really coming back to this idea of developed countries versus developing. So it's trying to point out that when you look at consumption, uh, the darker you are, or I should say the more red that the country is, the more resource it uses. So you can see the US and parts of Europe have really high consumption rates. You also see Canada, uh, many other parts of Europe, Australia, certain parts of like the Middle East. You'll see their use rates are much, 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 much higher than some of these countries that are yellow. These guys are using very, very, very few resources. And so that's part of what drives this as well, is this is not something where every person on the planet is using too much of things. Oftentimes this comes down to some of the richest people on the planet are using too much of things, and they're still messing things up for the rest of the planet. So that's another thing to try to consider as we address how we cope with our resource use we really have to focus in many cases on these wealthier countries to try to get them to curb their usage or increase their amount of things like recycling or efficiency and so that way they can still get around this and help us as a whole benefit. Now if we're trying to protect a lot of the stuff that we have one of the ways to do that is to put it into a nature reserve where we prevent access, we prevent industry, we prevent hunting to try and allow those particular areas to remain wild. Now currently about 7% of the world's land is in a reserve, many of these through the UN as World Heritage Sites. Now with this, we'll also see that there's a focus right now on trying to protect certain areas. We know we can't protect everywhere because people are still going to have cities, we still have to farm, but there's a big effort to focus on these hotspots, these biodiversity hotspots. And the way you get a hotspot is you have to be in an area that contains over 1500 plant species that are endemic. And what that means is there are plant species found nowhere else. So if this area gets destroyed, lots and lots and lots of these plant species go with it. Extinct. The other necessary criteria is you have to have experienced at least 70% habitat loss in that area. And for most of these, if you look on average, it's about 90% loss that they've suffered. So these are areas that currently are experiencing a lot of pressure, a lot of damage, from lots of human activities that cause us to chop down the trees or pollute the waters or overfish them. 
And so at this point, we're trying to focus on like the most bang for our buck, the areas that are most under threat, that have the most biodiversity that we lose if we lose them. And you can just see from the picture here, the green were the original biodiversity hotspot sites uh, that were approved by the UN that they're focusing on. And then they've added these blue ones. So now they're up to a little bit over 30 of these biodiversity hotspots that they're trying to kind of focus on and pull through to keep a lot of the diversity that we have on this planet. Now, if we've already screwed up an ecosystem, you know, beyond just preserving, there are some ways to try to fix it. Now, the simplest one is if we have things like fragmentation, where we've got these little chunks of habitat that aren't as useful because they're so small, when you have small objects, small areas, uh, their biodiversity is just less. Because there's not as big of an area, you can't have a lot of bigger species live there, so you're not going to see as many species. You're also, because they have small populations, going to see less genetic diversity. So these are not near as good as having one bigger area. You know, you'd much rather one big island than two small ones. And so one of the ways to kind of bridge this idea of fragmentation, these smaller pieces, is to do things like building corridors. So if you know that you've got a chunk of areas that have fences, and so we'll just kind of draw you know, multiple things, one of the ways you can do this is just install ways, little channels, where the animals can travel through. So that way, even though you still have a lot of this, you have the ability for animals to get from one side to the other. If you have things like roads, one of the ways to get across that is you can have a road and you can build, I'm going to try to draw this kind of crappy, uh, an underpass. So you can put some fencing up along the sides of the road here so the animals don't have to worry about being forced across the road. They can avoid it and they can just walk along the fence until there's this dug down underpass that they can travel through. So that means they can get across the road now without having to go over the road. So this is kind of the opposite in many cases of what you guys might see in certain populated areas where they build the overpass where people can walk across the little bridge that takes them to the other side. In this case, it's just typically done where it goes down and it goes below the road. So these are fairly simple ways if we build them and they're not that, that expensive uh, to allow us to have animals get access safely to larger areas which allows our biodiversity and genetic diversity to flourish. Now the other ways we can kind of fix things is to go through and try two processes called bioremediation or biological augmentation. Now bioremediation is using something typically like a prokaryote, uh, it could be a fungus, but these are going to be usually like decomposers that will break down some pollutants and convert them to a safer form. So if there's something like plastics, there could be oils, there could be various substances that we have that have spilled or gotten in the way. And if we use some of these natural organisms, we can place them there and they can process much of that pollution naturally and convert it to something more stable and more safe. So this is gaining popularity versus dumping a bunch of more chemicals to try and clean it up. But then now you've got the problems of the chemicals you just dumped causing essentially pollution. So bioremediation right now, we're breeding and we're trying to focus on getting better and better uh, organisms that can do this task of getting rid of pollution for us. So eventually we might be able to solve it in a more natural way versus trying to solve it in a more industrial way of you know heavy machinery and using more chemicals. And then biological augmentation works well in many ecosystems where we've gotten rid of many of these predators and that allows the guys that are below the predators, that, that the predators ate, it allows them to reproduce uncontrollably. And so because of this, we now get all these additional problems because there's, in this case, too many aphids, and then they eat the crops and the plants and it bothers us. So one way is we could just spray plants down with pesticides to try to kill the aphids. But that also kills a lot of good insects, so it's not an ideal solution. It can worsen one part of the problem. So one solution is to go through and reintroduce or introduce predators for the pest species and let them clean it up. In this case, we've introduced ladybugs. Technically a beetle, but we'll let that go. And so once we introduce these guys, they go through and at every stage of their life cycle, larvae to adult, they eat aphids. So that's why we see now so many more lady beetles uh, going around nowadays because we've used them specifically to help clean up our pest problem. So now we don't need to pollute things with pesticides or damage the good insects. Now we can win the war by just having more troops on our side. Uh, this is also what we did when we reintroduced wolves to Yellowstone. You had where there was a whole bunch of deer and, and, and in some cases even bison getting out of control because they were able to reproduce without these natural predators. 
as soon as we reintroduce these wolves, we start to see that things start to go back to normal because the wolves will kill many of the deer. The wolves also change the patterns of the deer, which are more beneficial now to the environment because it prevents the grass from being overeaten. Uh, it allows for things to grow more along the rivers to prevent erosion. So there's a whole bunch of benefits you can get by just introducing a predator that either will take care of the prey that's out of control, or in many cases, it's introducing a predator that we killed off, you know, that used to be there. So this isn't even really a new thing. It's just going back to the old situation before we messed it up. The other idea that we had from that slide before was that the more area that's affected, the harder it is, the longer it is for us to fix the damage. So in this case, we can see a fairly mild disturbance, a tree falling. This is still a disturbance. It does still affect that area. But this disturbance is over a small area, and it won't take long to ultimately be counteracted, to be fixed. And so in this case, you'd see within a matter of a decade or two, you'd likely have where things are back to pretty much normal. So this one could be because of people, you know, bulldozing, or it could just be natural. You've got other ones that can be because of people or natural that have a bigger impact, like forest fires. So we can cause forest fires. This can also happen from lightning and other natural phenomena, but this affects a much bigger area, so it tends to take a much longer time to get back to normal, if you will. You're oftentimes talking decades here, or in some cases it might even be 100, 200 years. And then as we get to almost purely man-made issues, we've got stuff like nuclear bombs, which affect a fairly large area and do severe damage to it. So it takes a much longer time to fix. You're talking in the order of probably hundreds of years. Uh, and we've got agriculture, which affects a huge area. And depending on what chemicals we've used, this can also take quite a while to fix just because you have such a large area. You know, going through this process of succession can take a very long time when all of it's been laid bare. And in some cases, it's been... Uh, laced with herbicides that kill the plants for a certain period of time. They actually plant specific plants that are genetically modified that allows them to grow even when the herbicide is present that kills everything else. So with agriculture, we can also see this human-caused widespread damage that can take a longer period of time for things to go back to how they were. They would still go back, but once again, it's going to be harder to get things to go back to the way that they were.